Well, I'll welcome you. Um, I'll share a story about um, my um, religious uh, heritage is, is Jewish. And um, in Judaism, there's a rule. Um, it's often suspended. But the rule was that to um, engage in community worship uh, required 10 people. Of course, back then it was 10 men. Uh, and it was also 10 men who had come of age. Uh, but now it's it's 10 people. Um, but again, um, if you don't have 10 people, it shouldn't stop you from engaging in community, uh, whether it's worship or study or anything else. So as much as I would like to have all 10 of us here today, we'll start with uh, the group of seven we have. Um, just another housekeeping matter. I mentioned briefly to Dafe and um, Lorelta that um, for the last class, um, I'd like to have some interaction. I'd like to do a project of some sort. Um, and I think maybe I'll break the class into two groups and maybe we will um, do a sort of problem solving. And, and I didn't say two sides because this is not, you know, whenever you split into two groups, there's a tendency to think that you are competing against each other uh, or, you know, in conflict in some way, or there's a right or wrong. And we'll talk today in our lesson about dyadic thinking and dyadic approaches to problem solving. That's not it. So uh, it will be two groups, but the groups can certainly work together. Um, and I haven't thought yet of a problem or a subject matter, but that's what I'm thinking. So I just wanted to put that thought in your head. And I want to give you, we only have um, two more weeks after this one. So uh, early in the coming week, I'll make sure to um, uh, create the problem and, and create the structure for uh, approaching it. All right. So with that said, I'm going to try to put uh, uh, put together um, a lecture today uh, based on a PowerPoint that uh, Herman Green, I think many of you know Herman. Um, Herman was the one who um, prepared this slideshow for a two hour class. And um, unfortunately we don't have two hours. So I've, I've done some work on it and I've shortened it and I will um, try to get it done in an hour here. So here we are. Uh, let me share. Uh, sharing this one. Share. Right. Put this baby into slideshow mode, I think. Um, oh boy. Uh, what's going on here? Oh boy. Um, oh boy. Uh, <laughs> I've somehow turned my cursor into. 10, and that's not going to work. Oh, okay. Here comes 18. Nice. Uh, give me one second. Slideshow. All right. Um, do I have full screen? Do you all see full screen? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Good deal. Uh, okay, then. So, yeah, we're going to cover the uh, conceptual frameworks of Earth Law um, today. Um, I'll start with this overview. Um, as I've said before, earth law is a field of practice. It's a subject matter. It goes well beyond what one would call the traditional confines of law. Uh, we also describe it, earth law, as ecocentric law. And it is very much a body of law, a group of laws, legal systems that are emerging. And so when we published this book two years ago, um, it was emerging and it's had continued to emerge. And um, we hope Earth Law will continue to emerge for decades and centuries until humankind understands that um, it is Earth that is at the center of our world. It's not the humankind that is in the center of the world. We are inside within the Earth community. And then the subtitle, A Guide for Practitioners, is intended to provide tools, not only to lawyers, uh, but to all people who seek to implement earth law. Um, Mary Christina Wood, she wrote the, uh, op uh, the, the foreword to the book. Uh, you might have read it. And what she explained is, we are this first generation to understand the consequences 
of what we've done as humankind to develop as humans and to manipulate the earth over the past few generations. Um, in earth law, we view this as an urgent emergent practice, and we view ourselves as the last generation that will be doing anything about it. Now, of course, the generation that succeeds us will do something about it as well, as will the generation after that. So each succeeding generation must accept the responsibility of being the last generation to do anything about it. There's a Supreme Court justice in the United States, a, a, vel, a, a very well-respected Supreme Court justice named Oliver Wendell Holmes. And what he wrote was that law is the witness and the external deposit of our moral life. Its history is the history of moral development. Uh, he used the words of the race, which is wholly inappropriate in our contemporary understanding of that word, but he was writing 50 years ago. Um, but is the, it is the moral development of our kind, of our species, of humankind. Um, when law feels untrue to our deepest sense of justice, it stings our collective soul, and that presses us toward reform. So I ask you in this moment in time during our class here today, seize this collective moment and let us share our spirits and share our minds and share our hearts in this study. So um, this is an interesting um, um, painting that Herman included and I just want to describe what it means to me. This was a conception of peace 200 years ago. And as you can see, there are colonizers on the middle, on the left. Uh, there are the colonized uh, who seem to be living so accept in, in such acceptance of this new order being opposed upon them. There is some nature in the background, the earth of, of, of water and mountains. In the very foreground in the center, we see the heavens. We see the God figures. We see the humankinds embracing this belief that there is a force beyond the human force. There is a force beyond earth and that's the universe. Um, and then we see all else. Um, we see animals of all sorts of livestock, of wild animals. Um, and they all look like they are, I, I believe, if you look at them in their eyes and their faces, as if they are looking at you, the human being, staring at that picture as the master. Um, it's, it's a moment frozen in time uh, of a very, very different understanding of the relationship between humankind and the world. And I'll say this later in the lecture, humankind has this capacity to create worlds uh, very different from nature, very different from the earth world, very different from the physical world, but we create our worlds. This is a world that we've created. Here is another world that we as humankind have created, certainly appears to be much more in harmony with nature than the previous world, but they are both real physical worlds. To share an understanding of law in the broader context, earth law isn't going to fix technically existing law. Earth law is emerging independently, of course, within existing legal systems, but it is, you shouldn't understand earth law to be the way of environmental law as it was perceived 50 years ago. Oh, environmental law. This is a fix. This will be added to existing law in the same way of existing law, written in positive law, written in regulatory law, written in constitutional precepts. That's not how earth law is going to work. Earth law will emerge as law becomes reoriented and governance becomes reoriented to our understanding through science, through social sciences, through our intuition, and through the spirit of humankind 
that will bring us to a new recognition of what law might do when we create law, not just for the benefit of humans, not just to regulate human behavior among other humans, but to regulate human behavior in, rea in relation to all of the other millions of species and the non-living but life support systems that are composed of the rivers and the mountains and the forests and the soils. These are the co-evolving systems that comprise the backdrop of earth law. It is the earth. I've mentioned before the ontology of separation, this belief that humans are something different from nature and separate from nature and the perceived supremacy of humankind. It obscures Earth's blueprint. The blueprint of Earth comes from the universe of which the Earth is simply a tiny little planet. But this is the blueprint. Um, as we develop earth law, we look not just at law, but the other rules, the other systems that regulate human behavior, political systems, economic systems, systems of agriculture, systems of medicine. And of course, the more deeply embedded systems of religion and culture and customary law. And we must understand that science has taken a role in the world created by humans, that is a very, very powerful role. And science will also play a role in effectuating the needed systemic change that we will engage in. And I remind you again, one of the theories of change that is propelling the development of Earth law is that consciousness altering in ourselves, aligning ourselves and sensitizing ourselves to the dynamics of Earth. It's that altered consciousness that will ultimately generate the systemic change. Um, so chapter two of the book speaks to the origins of Earth law, that Earth law is both a departure from environmental law and a new context for its extension. And we have seen and spoken about how current environmental laws have not stopped environmental degradation. Quite to the contrary, it legalizes pollution. It legalizes dumping. It legalizes mining. It legalizes deforestation. We can't have laws that permit environmental degradation. In this chapter, we begin to look at how earth law is different from environmental law and how it responds, as I've said, to the need of humankind to create a new framework for its relationships with non-human nature. I'm going to very briefly explain, as I expect you all know, why extant, why the current environmental law falls short. It addresses local conditions of water, of air, of land. Um, it is international in its um, systemic structure with um, permits that are approved by governments, uh, within governments that are controlled by corporate interests, by corporate interests, which have no understanding of Earth except as a resource for human exploitation. That humankind has adopted in corporate world thrives upon this myth that resources are endless, that mm -hmm. the restoration of Earth's, uh, Earth's capacity to restore itself is inexhaustible, um, that through mechanistic understanding, and I would place AI, artificial intelligence, in this context of mechanistic understanding, that mechanistic understanding places nature at the service of the economy. And of course, environmental law has holds this perverse belief that compliance with our regulations is in fact protecting the environment. And we argue about whether it protects us or how it protects us. I mean, 
we we have to come to understand that environmental law is not protecting the environment. Environmental law legalizes within limits set by governments the destruction of the environment. We'll skip one. So in Earth law, we have this orientation, we've spoken about it before, of connection, entanglement, and mutuality. In the science fields of biology, ecology, geology, and Earth system science, we have come to understand that although the Earth works in ways we don't fully understand, it does work as a whole. And that every time that we tinker with a particular part or a particular strand in the web of the Earth systems, we are incurring consequences, some understood, some not understood, that will impact the system as a whole. Natural law for indigenous people arose from hundreds, thousands of years, many, many generations of observing nature, of seeing how nature worked, and then observing that by human's touch, by human impact, we can change nature, we can interact with nature, that we, humankind, have agencies, just as all other aspects of nature have agency to affect how nature will interact. In the modern period, and I use this to describe since about the uh, 17th century, um, just as taste and scent and color and beauty were, were banned from science, science became empirical, so too in this past 400 years have customs, mm -hmm. ethics, values, justice, morals, manners, and sentiment have been subordinated to the mechanistic understanding of all of nature other than humankind. What gives life to the law is nature. In earth law, we need to bring life back into the law. These are some emerging approaches to earth law and I'm just gonna recite them, uh, reiterate them because we've touched on them briefly. The public trust doctrine is a belief that our governments owe an obligation, not just to all existing humankind, but to posterity, to the future of humankind and the future of all other kinds, to hold in trust nature, the air we breathe, the waters we drink, the lands that provide us with our food and our clothing and our shelter. Most of law today, certainly what I would describe as Western law is based on rights. All rights are initially held by humans. Human then shares those rights, sometimes with corporations, non-human beings, Certainly humans share those rights with nation states. The rights-based approach is the only approach that um, is held to, let, let me put it this way. The rights-based approach is not the only approach. However, it's the only approach that the vast majority of humankinds understand or are willing to believe in. We need to open our minds to non-rights-based approach. But that's not to say that rights-based approach don't have their role in the development of earth law. As we've spoken about before, rights of nature, rights of future generations are developing concepts within youth law, earth law. Those are ecocentric in the extent that they are not centered on the human being. An anthropocentric right that is an aspect of earth law, is human environmental rights or the human right to a healthy environment. Animal rights are also a non-human rights-based approach, but a rights-based approach. And um, I might be able to talk about uh, animal rights in a, in a later lecture. I'm preparing a talk on animal rights um, 
for a conference I'll be uh, speaking at in New Zealand uh, in a few weeks. Um, Ecocide, uh, we haven't spoken about, but I hope you all understand that uh, Ecocide is a law against massive killing of ecosystems, of, of non-human life. Um, and it's a crime that is being asserted to become the sixth international crime, along with human rights violations and genocide and um, some of the other international laws that are adjudicated by the International Criminal Court. Uh, we spoke, as we did last, last week in depth, about indigenous legalities. Um, and I've also noted here an approach an, an aspect of earth law that's been developed by um, many, but very much by the earth law center. We've developed our own program to bring nature consciousness into corporate governance, to put nature on the seat of boards of directors in corporations. Um, the conceptual fra uh, frameworks, um, are, are, are pretty basic, and, and I understand that um, you all have a sense of these conceptual frameworks from the reading. We must live within the planetary boundaries. Once we push beyond the limits of Earth's capacity, the chemical, biological, and geophysical capacities, uh, we don't know what the consequences may be, but we do know that they will be dire. Um, we must prospectively care for ecosystems. We must preserve biodiversity. We have an obligation. One of the frameworks of earth law is to restore damaged ecosystems and the loss of biodiversity. That becomes very challenging because as sad as we might be to realize this, we must realize that we have done so much damage that some ecosystems simply cannot be restored. I, I will use an ex example, our coral reefs. Coral reefs around the world are in rapid decline and the scientific community has determined that as we seek to preserve and restore coral reef ecosystems, not all of them are even remaining susceptible of restoration. We need to focus on those that actually will be restorable bearing in mind that the ocean will continue to heat, that the system, that this coral will continue to be bleached, and that no amount of human engineering at this point, or even human imagination, will be able to save some of these coral reef systems. Uh, one of the concepts of conceptual frameworks, as I mentioned, is the protection of human environmental rights, the right we have to an environment that will continue to sustain human life. And this is one framework of earth law that is not embedded and quite, 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 quite candidly is, is rejected by the um, United Nations. We must justly share the burdens of mitigating and adapting to climate change and other environmental stresses. And the reason I'm saying that this is not adopted or accepted by the United Nations is the United Nations supports sustainable development. And the sustainable development theory of change basically imposes on the global South, the developing world, the ideas of development created by the developed world. And that simply isn't going to work. Nature must be taken into consideration in her own right and the benefits and protections and remedies that are afforded by law must be extended to nature, not simply for the benefit of humankind, but for the benefit of nature in her own right. The Anthropocene or Anthropocene, I've Got no agreement on uh, the pronunciation there, uh, is a geological term. And I think it's helpful, especially for humans who see time in our super fast way of nanoseconds and Instagram posts and um, headshots and uh, talking heads. And we, we look at, 
at, at time in such small, small segments. An hour might even seem like a long period of time. But as I do um, each week in class, um, I try to get some sort of mind shift. And today is um, one in which I'm going to ask each of you to just use your own words to describe how long there has been an Earth. Just just a minute or two. So uh, let me start with you, Anthony, just using your own words. Tell me, how long has Earth been how long has Earth been around? Okay, thanks very much, Tony. Uh, I would very much rely on the uh, the records that we have in the fits. Uh, as far as we're concerned, there are historical accounts that give us some very clear 6,500 years. And without further foundation, one would think that uh, that's a good account. Of course, beyond that, we know that that's probably related to the existence of humans who probably kept records either uh, through our traditional oral uh, tradition or any form of writing at all. So I would say, uh, based on my background, uh, 6,500 years. Thank you. Well, I love that because you tie the history of Earth to the history of history. And written history essentially marks the beginning of history. It's a very interesting way of looking at it. Um, Lorelta, would you like to share? I think according to the... Uh... No, months, uh, as you said, when documentation started, uh, it should be about uh, between six, five, seven thousand years ago when documentation started. But it could have been much earlier than that. It could have been much earlier than that. But when documentation started, yeah. yes. it could be between uh, six, five, seven thousand. Okay, Ethan. Can I ask you to unmute? Maybe not. It's when the earth started. Yes. 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 Sandra, Sandra, why don't you go next? I, I want to believe it's more than what I want to say, but on the religious aspect, you keep hearing over two thousand years ago, but. That was based on when Christ came. So before then, so I want to believe it's more than 2,000 years ago. Okay. Chevy, what do you think, man? For well, me, I, I will go with the biblical accounts. I know science has given us uh, uh, millions of years before, but if we go by what is in the Bible, which uh, we practice and believe. Um, I think it should be, because I, I see stories of uh, before Christ, maybe 600 years before Christ, 1,000 years before Christ. So I, will, I want to go with that account, the biblical account. So maybe if to me, I would say maybe like 4,000 years. Okay. Missy, would you like to uh, share in the conversation? She's around. I was thinking that Homo sapiens are about 120,000 years old. I think that's another way of looking at it. So I'm sorry, I got these. Uh, so now I'm going to show you this um, chart. This is um, geology lesson. Um, and uh, it shows, um, as I said before, uh, we talk about the Anthropocene. That's a geologic term. And um, uh, I'm going to start back with the, um, if it ends with an in, like Anthropocene, uh, that's an era. And an era is a pretty short period, uh, 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 well, a pretty short, not, not a short period of time. The, I'm sorry. The Anthropocene is an epic. And an epic is a pretty short period of time. So if you go from the largest to the smallest, the earth has been in existence. It came to coalesce from the gases 
and the solids of the universe. It came together um, about four and a half billion years ago. And geology is defined uh, four eons that um, make up this four and a half billion years. And several of them together is, is a super eon. The last eon is the um, Phanerozoic. I think I pronounced that right. Um, and, and that is... 500 million years, over 500 million years is the last eon. Within that period, there are three eras. Those are, as you can see, these are millions of years, you know, many millions of years. The Paleozoic era, that's when the dinosaurs were alive. Dinosaurs had a great run, man. The dinosaurs were around for 250 million years. Wow. I'd like to just think about this for yourself again. Do you think if the humankind has been around for a hundred thousand years now, about, do you think we're going to make it 250 million? I don't know. I hope so. Um, the Mesozoic era, again, this includes uh, the period of dinosaurs, the last period. You all probably have heard of the Jurassic Park movie. Um that went up to um, very recently, um, you know, just about um, three million years ago. We're in this era right now called the Cenozoic era. And that was after the dinosaur extinction and after mammals started to um, proliferate. And ultimately, um, as you see here on the right, humans evolved. And I like this one a little bit better, okay? If you see this tiny little line here, okay? This is it for humans. All of this was before the humans. You know, here's here's the non-avian dinosaurs. Here's some first, the first land animals went back about 500 million years ago. Uh, and of course there were sea creatures before then, but all of this period of time up to here, there was no um, biological mm -hmm. life in the way we understand it right now. Um, so I, I give you this idea again, it's, it's, it's a paradigm shifting thing to try to understand earth. Earth is our mother, but we've only been born so recently. And our mother's been here for four and a half billion years. And let's take care of our mother, okay? Our mother's taken care of us well enough. It's time to start taking care of our mother. Um, I'll, you all have this um, um, PowerPoint. You can look at it. But I, I want to just make this point that the Anthropocene, this marks a period of time. It began about 1950. Um, and... It reflects a rupture, a drastic change in the geologic history of the Earth that is the result of human activity on the Earth system. The Anthropocene defines this system. Anthropocentrism, centrism, puts anthro, man, humankind, in the center of the system. Well, that's not necessarily bad. If you understand that we have responsibility, when we are in the center of a system, we have responsibility to everything that surrounds us. And we're imperiled by everything around us. We are fragile creatures. And this is very much tied into indigenous wisdom. We as humans, as I said at the beginning of this lecture, are world-making creatures. And our world on Earth is a dynamic, self-organizing system characterized by constantly emerging properties. So the question I ask is, how will we as humankind engage as an agent in this world? And... These are Latin terms, as are many of the uh, terms of theology, uh, but we use the term homo sapiens to refer to this type of human being that um, has sapiens, has wisdom. 
And again, we have a date that we fixed to the rise of this species of humans about 100 or 120 years, 200 maybe thousand years ago. Um, it, it's hard to be much more precise. But again, just a, a very, very, very tiny slice of Earth's history. We, as this species of Homo sapiens, have been leaving our mark on this planet. In this evolutionary time of the Anthropocene, we have to continue to evolve. And I'd like to describe the current state of humankind as primarily economic beings, the homo economicus, the human economic being. And there's two terms that I've heard that have used to describe this um, um, aspirational species that we would like to become. And believe me, I am fully convinced that we can manifest our own evolution. We just have to think it and live it and be it. And we will, we will transform from economic beings to ecological beings, homo ecologicus, or eco sapien, those beings that have the wisdom of the earth, of the entire ecosystem which the earth provides for all of her all of her members. So on to a more technical uh, description of earth law, philosophy, and jurisprudence. Um, jurisprudence is a definition. That's the philosophy of law. Um, the reigning jurisprudences, the, 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 the foundations of law as we understand it today, uh, are legal positivism. These are rules. These are um, commandments, like the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt honor thy father and mother. Uh, you cannot dump your wastewater into this river unless you have a permit. Um, legal positivism grew from legal re realism. And legal li realism is a very fluctuating basis for the law because, as we know, our understanding of what's real is changing constantly. Computers are real, but they weren't real 50 years ago. Um, so, so these are our two reigning jurisprudences. In Earth law, we open up these possibilities to revive natural law based on the observation of nature, which gave rise to the indigenous wisdom we spoke about last week. Earth law embraces critical legal studies concerning how, inter how law is not simply this structure for managing human behavior with other human beings. Law interacts with societies and nature, and we are learning through critical analyses of legal frameworks how to regulate human behavior in accordance with new standards. And these new standards are not just science. They are not just the social contract theory that arose in the uh, 18th century. Um, the new normative standards include what we have learned through the practices. And I use the term practices intentionally here. Practicing religion, cultural practices, ceremony, rituals. Of course, the positive law that I mentioned and customary law. The law isn't written, but the law that we understand, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit more in a minute here, uh, customary law, and then normative jurisprudence. I've said this before, social norms change, and as social norms change, then the law adopts to those changing normative understandings, and the norms of the community become uh, reflected uh, and, and, and uh, memorialized, codified in the law. The nature-culture divide, we've spoken before about the ontology of separation, and we know that nature is one integrated organic evolutionary whole, that humans are just 
not at the top of the pyramid, I used this graphic before, but in the circle, um, that nature is a physical world and exists and has existed and will exist before and after human artifacts are, 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 are gone. What we have extracted in the modern world is that humans are separate from nature, that we have boundless resources, that nothing can stop us and things will just get better and better and humankind can get bigger and bitter, bigger and defy the laws that apply to all other species, which when they get too big, nature restricts them. Well, it's gonna happen to us, of course, too. We've gotten too big and nature is restricting us. Nature is restricting us perhaps most um, uh, conspicuously with uh, climate change and weather events. Um, this myth that we can always substitute human capital, that human brain will conquer all, that puts humans above nature, and we know that's not true. We must become more humble and understand that human capital will never replace nature's capital. And I'll just note on page 74 of the book, um, we investigate this word nature and, and how it's distorted and, and gives, gives this understanding that permits us to think of humans as separate from nature. Um, so good nature versus commoditized nature. I, I, I mean, what, what is nature if it's not only something for humans to use for whatever purposes humans believe will embedder life for humans? What is it we're trying to preserve when we say we need to protect nature? What are we trying to protect when we say we're trying to restore nature? What is it we're trying to restore? Um, I, I, I am a homeowner and I have a plot of land on which I have a house. Um, some of it has concrete on it, of course, and um, that's not great because when you put an impervial surface over anything, think if you wrapped yourself in 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 cellophane, in, in plastic wrap, you, you won't do well when you seal yourself. Um, and I feel bad about that. Um, but then I have lots of soil and I try to nurture my soil and I grow plants and I um, raise vegetables and, and some fruits. It's an area for my for my animals, I, only dogs, but um, you know, they have uh, their um, role in my yard to keep out the rabbits and the chipmunks that eat my plants. But I find that we all live copacetically and the chipmunks and squirrels and rabbits and such get their share and actually way more than their share. And I make do what, uh, on what makes it uh, past them and the, what makes, makes it past them and my dogs. Um, I, I'm just giving you this example so that you can look at your responsibilities, whether you own land or not, there is certainly a responsibility that you can assume to care for land, to care for a piece of water, some of the air. And, you know, as an owner of property, that's a responsibility that comes with ownership. And um, perhaps it's more difficult to understand uh, for one who doesn't own the property. Um, but until we have an earth in which all of earth is held by all of earthlings in trust for each other, this is the public trust doctrine. Until then, we need to assume responsibilities for caring for nature. The science isn't going to make decisions for us. We, as humans, tend to base a lot of our decision-making on science, but I ask you to engage with nature, to commune with nature, and to understand, you need not necessarily doubt science, you just need to understand that science doesn't make decisions. 
Science is simply a tool available to humankind to help us make decisions. And this brings me back to what is good nature. It will be decided through political processes, through humankind's engagement with their governments, those by which we are governed, with corporations, because of course, corporations create governance structures that control us, whether it's big food or big medicine or big oil. These are corporate realities that will be part of the decision-making as to what is good nature, what will we preserve and restore and foster. And ultimately, although they are corporate beings and governments are government beings, without humans' input, without this consciousness-altered input that we, as ecozoans, as earth lawyers, as those proponents of earth jurisprudence, we will drive this process. So um, I've mentioned anthropocentrism. I've mentioned ecocentrism. I'm gonna to touch on biocentrism and cosmocentrism. As you might imagine by the suffixes, cosmocentrism goes beyond earth. That puts earth in its context, as I said before, is this tiny, tiny little spot of solid mass within a universe of solids and gases and spirits and forces that we don't understand. We cannot help as human beings but to be anthropic. Anthropic simply describes how we are, how we exist, how we be as humans, as anthros. I want to emphasize that as the only being that is conscious of its opportunity to affect changes in nature, in the earth systems, in the universe, we have a special role to play. And religion, faith, has very much held strongly to this belief that humans have a special role to play. Religion has led to perhaps this belief that humans are greater than all other beings, which I don't subscribe to, but I fully subscribed to religion in the sense that they recognize the special role that humans have to play. Obviously, rivers have a special role to play. They don't have feelings that we can empathize with, but they can't be separated from life. They are the water of life, and they have a psycho-spiritual mystique. They are as real as we are, and they have been around for much longer. And again, I believe that they have an understanding of their place in life support systems. And they are here as partners of humankind to continue to support life and give rise to new life. Um, quoting the scriptures here, um, the divine makes us to lie down by still waters that restores our souls. We are like a tree planted by the river now, these ideas are in all cultures and all traditions. And if you think about the music I've played, uh, the first two sessions, they all spoke about the rivers. And um, I, I, I encourage you, whenever you have the opportunity, uh, to go by a river, to sit by a river, and to think with the river. Earth law, just like the law of the rivers would write, if they could, would be thought about as having good manners. We share, we're respectful of others. If we receive something, we express gratitude. We return favors, and as importantly, we pay it forward without expectation of any specific favor in return but with the knowledge, the surety that we will 
have a favor in return. That reciprocity is embedded in the fabric of the earth. And to be kind, to tread lightly, and to leave as small a footprint as we might. I mentioned responsibilities, I've mentioned rights, and I've mentioned reciprocity. These three R's are extremely broad and, and they all have a role to play in the development of earth law. Right talk, I have a right, you have a right, we need to respect these rights. The future has a right, our children have rights. It's dominant, quite a dominant um, framework for the law. Um, and it's a framework that we need to examine very, very thoughtfully and very, very critically. And if we want to continue, as we ex I expect will for decades, if not centuries, with rights-based legal systems, we need to understand that rights don't exist without responsibilities. Uh, responsibilities is, I'm sorry, my dog's... Uh, had enough of me, but <laughs> I'll continue with her noise in the background, if you don't mind. Defining our responsibilities becomes easier in rights-based frameworks because law generally has a corollary in every written contract, rights bring with them responsibilities. But we don't always define responsibilities as the way nature would respond them for us. The public trust doctrine is promising, as I expect you realize. If we had a earth government that was responsible for maintaining the sustain life-sustaining properties of the earth, and that was its primary responsibility, we would feel much better about governance and being governed. Reciprocity, of course, we understand that if we give back to Mother Earth what she gives us, that will help us mend and restore and protect and preserve. And there's custom and culture, these ways of living together in lawful communities that isn't based on positive written law. That's not enough either. There's procedures and these are legal systems. These are frameworks, almost all of which are adversarial Oh, you have a claim, you have a defense, and you have a counterclaim, and you have a countersent. And our system is intended to resolve conflict through the adversarial process. That works and has worked to the extent we've created the world we now live in, but it is not the only system of procedures. There are many others that you have studied when we studied last week the African chapter the procedures of conciliation that bring together and resolve conflict and disagreement without an adversarial procedure. The main thing to take away here is that nature is taken into consideration as a subject of the legal community, as possessing rights and that the benefits and protections and, afford, and remedies that are afforded by law for humans must be extended to nature, not solely for the benefit of human beings, but for the benefit of nature in her own right. Um, I'm doing a quick time check here. And um, yeah, as I thought. Uh, we've been going on for an hour, so let me see where I'm at here. Too much, uh, maybe not too much to go. Um, can we have uh, 15 minutes? Can everybody hang in for another 15? As it gives me. Uh, yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah. All right. That's all right by me. Okay, thanks. Then we can finish this. And now I know that I go ahead. Go ahead. I Go simply ahead. cannot cram two hour PowerPoint uh, into one hour, but I've gotten pretty far. So um, these are some of the pillars of law, property, as I've said, rights, individual rights, communal rights, and the commons. Um, 400 
to 500 years ago following the the great plague and we came out of this period of feudalism of course this is well before the period we spoke about last week of colonialism uh but europe uh and and western europe in particular emerged from this period of feudalism um when there were simply property owners and everyone else was um a servant a servant of the owner of the land um coming out of that period the right to own property became the hallmark of freedom. Um, this is, of course, a very, very stark departure from the previous beliefs before feudalism when the territory on which a community resided belonged to itself and the community and the members, the human members of that community had a responsibility to respect and maintain the property. But now in the 17th century, coming out of the period of feudalism, its ownership of property was equated with freedom and personal autonomy of the individual rather than an obligation to the feudal lords. That was the goal to obtain individual rights, to obtain a vote, a right to participate in the decision-making of society, of free commerce to engage in trade and free speech and free religion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We had all of this, this new understanding of an individual right. And then we began to agree upon these forms of conduct that um, would be imposed upon us by governments. And we had the right to choose who would govern us and what our governments would look like. And John Locke, um, one of the philosophers of the 17th century, whose thoughts were very much uh, underpinning of what we now refer to as the social contract, um, he proclaimed that life, liberty, and property, these were the fundamental inalienable rights of human beings. And of course, they separated humankind from the rest of nature because we didn't look at life and liberty and property as values for anyone other than humankind. This is not earth law. This is not earth law at all. And we'll try to get to the chapter called the New Ecological Social Contract next week. That's a social contract that isn't based on these theories of property ownership and individual rights. The new ecological concept, the new ecological contract is based on the concepts embedded in earth law, respect, reciprocity, and um, mutuality, um, non-adversarial decision-making. Earth law is concerned with the flourishing, flourishing of life. An ecological contract is based on this concept of the ecozoic, a house of life. The critical role of earth law is its recognition that law is a system that creates lawscapes. And our current lawscape that in emphasizes individual rights over communal rights and the commons must be replaced by a new social contract. Representing nature is very challenging, as we know. We've talked a little bit about guardianship. Um, nature is dynamic. It's constantly co-evolving and systems are co-evolving with each other. And either or logic doesn't work. That's not what drives evolution and the natural development of the earth. In the law, it's always reduced. Decisions are reduced to dyadic conflicts, one side or the other, or sometimes polyadic concepts where there are three or more parties advocating for different outcomes but it doesn't look at the whole. It just looks at the outcome claimed by one party or the other. 
in this way, law has completely lost its context. The lawscape that is now governing human relationships with each other and with non-human nature has completely lost its context. What the new earthscape, the ecozoic earthscape, ecocentric earthscape will reflect is new laws based on relationality, care, duty, reciprocity, and a new context, and I'll quote Thomas Berry, in which Earth is a community of subjects. The role of law and legal ethics, just this is, a, a, again, a quick overview. What does the law do? It regulates behavior. It settles dispute. It provides recompense for injuries and grievances. It punishes that which is forbidden. It protects against harm. It proscribes rights that may not be violated. It preserves assets. And it enables social transactions and decision makings. Earth law adds to these lists because Earth law also ensures that Earth remains a habitable planet for humans and other species and for future generations. So let me ask you, and, and this is something I'd appreciate if you wouldn't mind to the next week, answer this question for me. Send me a paragraph or two, a page, no more, please. Are we violating the great law? Are we causing irreversible harm? And as you think about this question, think back about the dimension of time. And I asked you all about time and history, and we talked about it, all of you, in terms of thousands of years. That's human time. But human time isn't the right time to be in Earth, to, to study Earth law. We need to reorient ourselves. And the dimension of time, the mention of geological time, is frighteningly relevant. Do we want to live on this earth as human beings as long as the dinosaurs? I think we do. And how might we do that? We will do that by learning to live in harmony with the earth and the earth's life support systems. So I mentioned the new social contract, a new ecological social contract. This contract will, of course, reflect these ideals that humankind has developed of democracy, of justice, of equity and peace. Can we have peace on earth, in earth, with earth? How do we live well, especially we of the global north, with earth and all of our beings, so as to bring about a principal transition to an ecological age? Our present social contact is with other human beings. And one could argue with this belief, this fallacious belief that economic growth can continue forever. Can we fashion an ecological social contract? Should we, could we, as human beings, settle for anything less? As an author of this book, I absolutely reject this characterization of a social contract that is our permanent state of being. The optimal choice is one that recognizes what we have learned about Earth from our science. It's an acceptance of reality. It's an embrace of the Earth community. And it's a doorway to freedom within the limits of nature, within the limits of Earth's law to cultural, and social revitalization and the flourishing of life on earth. And that's on page 92 of the book. And that's where I'd like to end the lecture. And um, I'd like to just do a little circle time and go around and uh, ask each of you to uh, share some thoughts and um, bring our class to a close. Daffy, why don't you? Thank you very much, Tony. We'll, we'll, we'll enjoy your thoughts. 
and um, want to thank you. Uh, we have get it fulfilled, fulfilled by the concept of the right of nature in Africa through this um, uh, courses, classes we are having. Today's lecture has been inspirational, and uh, we hope that all of us are in this class a special African. And uh, as we go and get along with this uh, this class, we hope that we we'll continue to develop a serious interest in this very important uh, course, which I regard I regard as a mother of all courses. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you, man. Thank you, uh, uh, Jevi. Yeah, to, to me, as you were talking, what was coming to my mind, which is uh, inspirational, is really what will happen in a hundred years and what will happen in a thousand years. Uh, the rate we are going, I wonder whether the Earth will be able to survive the kind of uh, pressure we are putting on it, even in terms of population growth. Uh, maybe like uh, a hundred or maybe a thousand years ago, the earth was less than one billion people. Today, we are hitting eight billion. So if you imagine that these eight billion have to eat, they have to move around, they have to do things, you just find that uh, there is going to be tremendous pressure on the earth. And we need an ecocentric uh, approach to nature to allow it to survive. But my biggest worry is that how will this be implemented? The lawmakers will not accept to make some of these laws. The politicians in office will not accept to implement these laws. The businessmen will also not allow these laws to uh, succeed. And considering that the earth law is not just about the, the environmental aspects, it's going to go into economics, into politics, into religion. Some of our cultural beliefs and our religious beliefs are like the rock of Gibraltar. You find it very, very difficult to, to change. So it's just uh, stirring up my mind on so many things that we can do and uh, we hope we'll be able to do them. Thank you. You are muted, Tony. Ah, sorry. <laughs> Here's my, I'm muting my dog is barking. Uh, Anthony, go right ahead. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much. It's been uh, very interesting. Uh, foundationally, I think that uh, we have exaggerated the position of humanity. Uh, we can see from the basic uh, information tonight that man, uh, is appearing, uh, if we use a 100-year scale, we're appearing in the last seconds of 100 years. Yet, we want to rule and take over and uh, insist on our ways. And uh, in terms of what we have rights to do, we also want to exaggerate that all belongs to us. So I think it is this uh, tendency, this belief that we need to work on in the next so long, uh, if we are to preach uh, this new uh, church message about that law, I would think that it is time for us to begin to look at how did we manage the first 5,000 years and perhaps more without this industrial impact. What were we looking at uh, when this industrialization started? The key issue for me is that a few people saw how to take over the earth, take over uh, the resources and utilize them only for themselves, which is what the politicians are doing, the governments are doing the same, and I think those are our problems. The natural man, the rest of us, who appear not to have responsibility, um, 
not to have authority are uh, generally sober enough to place uh, nature where it should be. So I think it's a question of our governance that is uh, giving us these challenges. And I hope that we'll be able to look at this critically later. Thank you very much. Very good, very good. Um, Lorelta? Yeah, yes. uh, the way I look at it, I know uh, it's like a new area, a new context that we have to try to enlighten people on. So we have to engage uh, NGOs, community-based organizations, the legislators, you know, so a kind of advocacy, enlightenment, exposure. So I think if we start from the grassroots with the proper enlightenment, gradually we build up to the legislators, then we could see how the laws could be pushed and eventually, you know. So I know it's going to be a hard work, but uh, more or less we're like pioneers now. We have to now open the eyes of, you know, NGOs, CBOs, legislators, and with time, by the time we see the benefits, which is for our own good in the long run, I think with time, gradually, it will be brought into. That's my own perspective. Very Thank good. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sandra? Uh, reflecting on the class for today, can you hear me? Yes. I, I feel if we continue the way we are going as man, I don't think we'll have anywhere we'll call it soon. But I want to be optimistic, knowing that with more awareness, man will begin to know that our right cannot exist without responsibility. Rather than what we have it as existing presently, we can do with what our, our plot of land, the way we do like. Our thoughts and our orientation needs to be changed with more awareness to know that with right comes responsibilities. So the more we push it out there, I'm optimistic that man will change the orientation to connectivity rather than dominion. Very good, very good. Uh, Eten, if, are you back? Yes, I'm here, good evening. Wonderful. Thank you, would you like to uh, share? Yes, I will. So thank you so much for today. Firstly, I would like to say we have to actually have this consciousness there has to be the awareness that we have to create a systematic change. Like you said, there has to be the level of consciousness in us to know that we need to fix the earth. So with the level of industrialization, so much has gone wrong, but I believe that there's actually a room for change. So gradually, we have to let the whole nation where we live in, especially starting from Nigeria, we have to actually open up to educating the masses, including the government, on how we can move forward. So by the time we have that level of consciousness and the awareness on why we need to fix the earth, that's the way we can actually go forward. Thank you. Um... Well, uh, wonderful class today. I mean, I really feel like, um, yeah, like like we're getting somewhere. Uh, Hello, Tony. Hello, Tony. Yes. Hi, Daffy. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me, Tony? Yes. <laughs> okay. Let me just uh, let me just kind of way summarize the reflection of every every one of us with regards to the possibility of achieving right of nature or earth law in our society. Mm -hmm. uh, what I want to share is that practically, the earth law is in operation in Nigeria through Revaitio projects. Everything we have been discussing, everything you have been teaching us, we are, particular, we are particularizing them on ground. And from what we have experienced so far, we have discussed with all strata of people, from local people to national, to government, to politicians. They are very, very willing to embrace earth law. In many of the fora, many of the engagement we've had from the royal fathers, from the community chiefs, from the business sector, they are welcoming earth law. They, are, they have realized that they've made the mistakes they have realized that for them, for their business to grow, they have to work in harmony with nature. That is clear message. 
In mm. fact, one of the biggest company we have in Africa, Fresco, the biggest palm oil production in Africa, have agreed, have agreed seriously that the only way they can sustain their business is for them to, to work in harmony with nature. So what we need, what we need is just an enlightenment and education and engagement with all stakeholders. Nobody wants to invest in business and find out his business will be crumbled by the next day. So we shouldn't be afraid. What we should do, what we should do is to groom more people who will go, who will go out there and have an engagement with all set of people we have in any part of the world. Thank you. No, no. thank you so much, Dafe. That that's that's just a wonderful way to close. And um it's it's inspirational. So thank you. Um so yeah, we have two more classes. You know, I, I didn't really have a, a outline for the five because I thought, you know, we would just see how things go and 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 adapt. Um if there's anything that you all would like to uh do in the next class, um let me know. Um Dafa, you and I can speak and maybe Lorelta as well about uh, the project for um how we'll spend the last the last class. Um, but let's let's share some ideas. I mean, you have the book. Uh, if there's some specific subjects that you'd like to go into, um, I'll, I'll listen to that. Maybe we can do, you know, a, a few next week. But uh, I, I'll, I'll go wherever you all want to go. So, um, yeah, that sounds good. Uh, and Dafa, you and I will talk during the week. Okay, that would be great. Okay, my friends, thank you so much. Be well. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Very yeah. to the family. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Okay. Bye now. Bye bye. bye, -bye.